Welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof? Hello, Walter. Good day, Martin. Are you well? I'm very fine, thank you. Good. Let's open with a word of prayer. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you enlighten our minds, bless us with the Holy Spirit in this, in this discussion, and thank you for allowing us to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Martin, we are living in the last days. I also believe that uh, we are speedily heading for the climax of the age. Therefore, it is important that we understand the issues around the close of probation, mm -hmm. the latter rain, and everything that pertains to that. So we had two programs in a row now where we discussed current events, where we looked at uh, the issues in the news, the mm -hmm. Ukraine, Russia, all of these things. But we always want to make sure that we do not lose our spiritual foothold. Mm. Correct. So we want to look at the Gospel of John. And uh, many years ago, not many years ago, about four years ago, five years ago, Time flies, huh? Eh? Yeah. I gave a sermon that was titled For Your Ears Only. And uh, we want to look at what that actually pertains to with regards to the Gospel of John. But before we get there, let's just first talk about the significance of the disciples and the message that they bore. I don't know, Martin, whether everybody is aware of it, but originally the sequence mm. of the books in the New Testament wasn't the same as it is today. So if you take your Bible and you look at the New Testament, mm. you, know, you have a particular sequence. You have the Gospels and then you have the Book of Acts. And uh, today you start then immediately with the writings of Paul. Yes. And then right at the end, you have uh, the books of James and Peter and uh, the epistles of John and Jude. Yes. Now, originally, they were not at the back. They followed immediately after the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. So why they actually changed it is, is a bit of a mystery. But the original sequence is actually quite significant. Not that it changes the content of the Word of God, but it changes the, let's, how shall I put this? It changes the thoughts and the deliberations. Because Paul is the theologian who brings out the typologies, mm -hmm. but the, the elders, James and John, they were the ones, and Peter, that were basically giving the directive for how things should be understood in the future. And they were right after Jesus ascended to heaven. Correct. So and Paul came later, three and a half years later. Three and a half years later. Yes. So this was the message that was for the church. Yes. So when we look at the original order of the New Testament books, when the New Testament was originally canonized by the apostles Peter, Paul, and John, and that is an important aspect as well, you know, because people think that some church put it together. Or yes. The Catholic Church gave us uh, the sequences and all of these things. Nothing could be further from the truth. Long before there was a Catholic church. There was an apostle, Paul, Peter, and John. And they put together the canon of the New Testament. Then the general epistles were placed after the book of Acts and before the epistle of Romans. Now, the general epistles are the ones that refer to the writings of Peter and John and James and Jude. So the epistles James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John and Jude thus immediately followed the book of Acts. Mm. And the Byzantine text still follows this order. 
So it's just interesting. It doesn't change the Word of God. No. It just changes your mindset in terms of how you are prepared for what is coming next. Correct. It's like when you read a, a, a book, a novel, and you start in the middle and then go to the beginning and then to the end. It, it, you can get the gist of it, but it might change your mindset a little bit on it. Very well put. So if this order had been retained, there would have been less confusion regarding the issue of law and grace. Because if you jump right into Paul, mm. then you can become confused. And let's face it, I believe the world is very confused. That's exactly so what happened. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? Well, if you look at basically the Christian world, very rarely people actually do study the other books. They mainly study Paul. So that shows you that the, if, if the other book, they will probably get confused because of the way that Paul puts everything regarding the law. Yes, so if you had a very clear statement by the apostles and then you had the explanations and the writings of Paul, then you wouldn't lose your perspective that easily. So one of the issues that is very important is obedience to the law of God. Because the law of God is the standard of judgment. Yes, and it's also the standard on which sin is determined. Yes, because sin is transgression of the law. Now, there isn't the government in the world that doesn't base its justice system on law. Mm -hmm. hmm? So if we had a look at uh, the epistles of James and Peter and John, then we can see that they played a very important role in bringing this emphasis to the fore. So just a few examples. In James 1.25 we read, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So he places quite an emphasis on obedience. But also, if you put it like this, they were putting the law back into its rightful place because the, the leaders of the church at that stage totally distorted it. Yes. Uh, chapter 2, verse 9, he says, But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now, this is a very important statement here. In other words, what James is saying, don't listen to what the people are saying. Mm. Don't listen to what the Pharisees are saying. But listen to what the Word of God is saying. Mm. Don't be a respecter of persons. Preaching is important, but it's only of value if it is in harmony with the Word of God. That's it, yeah. Because people get so hooked up on people mm. that when those people disappoint them, they throw the baby out with the bathwater and suddenly they don't believe anymore. No, your, your anchor must be the Word of God. Your anchor mustn't be a Martin Smith or a Walter no. Fight or a whoever out there in the world. The anchor is the word of God. And should we just become totally apostate mm. one day, it doesn't change the word of God at all. Not at all. And the same with, um, like we have always mentioned, if there's apostasy in a church, it doesn't necessarily make the whole church apostate. No, and it doesn't negate the truth. Mm. So don't be a respecter of persons, but be convinced by the law. Because you can easily become a transgressor by following a person, yeah. if that person is very convincing. I mean, look at the devil, how convincing he was, right? Exactly. A even, third of the angels. Even this, if you follow the spirit, it can be totally wrong if, you don't, if the spirit is not according to the law. To the law and to the testimony. That's the whole Bible. So, verse 10 says, For so ever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Mm. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. So, Martin, let's be very specific. What law is he referring to here? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, definitely. 
Now, if they commit no adultery, yet thou kill, thou'd become a transgressor of the law. And I, I thought about that many times. If you covet, that's what the devil did in heaven. It started with the transgression of the 10th commandment. He coveted the position of Christ. If you covet, that's breaking the 10th commandment. So if you want to be in that position, you actually want to place yourself there, then you're actually breaking the first commandment. Yep. You shall have no other gods beside me. Yep. All right? That's it. And that is a species of idolatry. That's breaking the second commandment. Mm -hmm. That is a blasphemy against God. That's breaking the third commandment. If you then start tampering with the authority of God yep. and questioning the authority of God, then you're breaking the fourth commandment. That's it. And... God was his parent. He's breaking the fifth commandment. Eventually, you become so enraged that you're willing to actually kill your parent, which the devil actually did at the mm -hmm. cross. He killed Jesus Christ, hmm? yeah. who was his creator. Therefore, he broke the sixth commandment. Yeah. Did he create spiritual adultery? Yes. Did he break, therefore, the seventh commandment? Mm -hmm. Was he a liar and a thief? From the beginning. So he broke the eighth and the ninth. You start with the tenth, you break them all. That's it. Okay. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So, you know, this, this epistle was immediately after the book of Acts. So that sets the tone. That's it. And then if you read Paul... And it said it is by faith and not by works that you are saved. Then it has to be read in the context of this. Exactly. That's why Martin Luther said anyone that can marry James and Paul in the sense of understanding how they get together will understand how grace works. Yes. So it's very important. And this sequence is therefore rather sad that it has been changed, yes. right? Uh, chapter 4, verse 11, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. That's also a very interesting verse. Mm. So, you know, you can become such a stickler in the law, like the Pharisees did, that you set yourself up as judge. You start looking at your brothers and your sisters and you start saying, hmm, they're lawbreakers. But we all have our foibles, right? Yes. And if we have very strict definitions that aren't necessarily based on the word of God, but upon our opinions, like the Pharisees had, then everybody who doesn't do things exactly like you do them becomes a lawbreaker. Mm. So let's leave the judgment to God. To God. Yes. So this is a very balanced view that James portrays here. If we go to Peter, that was also there in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So obedience, was it important to Peter? Oh, definitely. And he said, start with me. And then he has this very interesting verse that most people would rather not have in the Bible. <laughs> and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? In other words, tread lightly. Yeah. Don't be presumptuous Ooh. and think, oh, I'm standing on holy ground. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. That word presumption. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Does this entail a changed life? Yes, so you can't, cannot just pronounce that I'm changed. Your works and fruits have to follow. So in other words, you can't say Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. There's nothing left for me to do except relax, right? Mm. No. You're not only called to glory, which is the character and the righteousness of Christ, you're also called to virtue. Yeah. You better yeah. do something. Mm -hmm. 
2 Peter 2 verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. That's pretty straightforward. You cannot twist that one. No. So in other words, it would have been better not to have known the righteousness than to turn your back upon what has been delivered in terms of obedience and all of those issues and virtue. But the Bible is interesting because can you not now say it's better not to evangelize because if they never knew they, were, they would have been saved? <laughs> yes, but if they never knew, they were probably or most likely in a very high probability lost. But there's also a verse in the Bible that says, if you don't tell them, their blood be on you. That's very interesting. You know, uh, there's also a statement in the Spirit of Prophecy which says, almost, but not wholly saved, is to be not almost, but totally lost. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty well put. Eh? Then let's go to John. Well, let's first look at the Gospel of John. This is Jesus speaking. He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. That's a promise. Yeah. So if you want Jesus to manifest himself, make known his principles, well, then you better keep the commandments, right? And it's also important to remember here, he is the one that empowers you to keep his own commandments, and then he can manifest himself. Yes. Now let's listen to the words of John himself in First John. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now Martin, if you had read the Bible in this, in this original sequence, and you come across these things, would you then be confused when Paul says, you are not saved by the law, but you are saved by grace? No, because now you'll know, okay, this is how important the law is. So when Paul says that, he's mean, making it or telling you, don't let you, uh, this become a human activity about keeping the law. It must be a godly manifested activity. All right, let's go to the book of Jude, which was the next one. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So can you change the grace of God into something that is condemnable? Unfortunately, people do. They do change <laughs> into condemnation. Yes. So these are the ones that followed immediately after the gospel. And they're pretty plain. Yeah. Now, let's go to the gospel of John, because I find the gospel of John so fascinating. Uh, this is something that might summarize it a little bit. The Gospel of John is unlike the synoptic Gospels. So the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospel, mm -hmm. Gospels. And they are basically eyewitness accounts and a bit of history that tell you exactly what transpired and many of the teachings and the way in which Jesus worked are supported by three witnesses. By two or three witnesses shall every word be established, right? But the Gospel of John is totally different because it, it's largely concerned with the last week of Jesus on earth and contains many portions which are not mentioned by the other Gospel writers. Mm. The Gospel of John relates no parables. That's interesting in itself, right? Yeah. 
It relates seven of the miracles of Jesus, of which only two, the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the sea, are in the other Gospels. That's interesting. Yeah. The miracles related by John testify to the divinity of Christ in a special sense. So the Gospel of John has a different emphasis. Hmm. It emphasizes the divinity of Christ, and it has a very special message for those that will receive the former reign yes. and by implication the latter reign. Yes. The water to wine speaks of the special cleansing. That's also a very interesting story in the Bible. Mm. Because when he changed the water into wine, many people use this as a license to imbibe in beverages, which has nothing to do with it whatsoever. Exactly. Because the water that was used was filled into the cleansing vats, yes, where did. they did a ceremonial cleansing, washing of the hands and washing of the feet, mm. which was a ceremonial cleansing. So that is the water that he used. Those stone jars that were outside and that had taps for cleaning your hands and your feet. Yes. He filled those with water and changed that water into wine, representing his blood. That's it. So what he was basically doing was saying there would be a higher cleansing than the cleansing of this water. Yes. And if you do not imbibe in that higher cleansing, you have no part in him. Yes. yes. So, it's a, it's a brilliant miracle, which can be brought down to the level of the mundane if you ignore the typology. And if you just use your logic and you do a little bit of research, you'll see that those jars represented pro approximately probably 800 liters of water. Yes. So, if you take in Jesus during the latter part of the wedding, changing water to 800 liters of wine for a wedding. <laughs> I don't think that's how it wor would work. No, no. So it was definitely unfermented because f the fermented wine would be a symbol of sin because fermentation was used as a symbol of sin. So all of those things need to be understood in the contents. The feeding of the 5,000 embraces humanity. So that's a very important miracle that is mentioned over there. And he's feeding them with the bread of life. It was a symbol of, of the you. bread of life, yeah. a symbol of himself. And the number five is the number of humanity. You have five senses. Mm. So that embraced all of humanity being fed by the bread of life. The walking on the sea. The sea in, in prophecy represents peoples, nations, multitudes, kingdoms. So he is the one who is the master of the sea. He is the, actually the owner of the universe. He is above the common laws of nature. He's not subject to them. He's above them. So this is part of his rulership, part of his, his uh, divinity. divinity. Mm. Then the royal official's son is an example of undaunted faith in the word. So here's a royal official who believed and said, it's not necessary for you to even come to my house. Just say the word and my son will be healed. And uh, this, is, this is undaunted faith. And this is the kind of faith that he required of his people. It's interesting that it's very often those that were not part of his people, like uh, Roman officials and centurions, uh, that were the perfect example of what faith entailed. Yes, they got it right. They got it right. Then the lame man at Bethesda and the stirring of the water addresses the superstitions of the professed believers. We can look into those sort of issues as well. The healing of the blind man is a witness to the church leaders, and then the raising of Lazarus crowns them all. Yeah. So this is basically what the emphasis of John is, to show the divinity. But there are other things in John that we need to 
uh, look at very carefully. The question is, why no parables? Mm. There are parables in all the synoptic gospels. Why no parables in the book of John? I believe it's because Jesus said that the parables are for the uninformed, but to his people he speaks plainly. The parables are a brilliant way of teaching without being so direct as to cause major consternation. You say something in a parable, then you get the message in obliquely. Yes, and also it is sometimes for some people more better explained through a parable. They probably wouldn't understand it. It's like an object lesson. That, exactly. So in John 16, verse 25, you read, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. So the Gospel of John is plain talk. Mm. It is a very direct testimony. And it's interesting that that is the testimony that enraged the Pharisees. Yeah and the Jewish leaders. But there's also very plain talk to the disciples that we will come to. Now, if we look at the, the structure of the book, so the first 13 chapters deal with these issues, but many of these happened in the very last portion of the ministry of Christ. Mm. Chapter 13 to 17 of the Gospel of John deals with the last Hours of the life of Jesus. So a substantial portion of the book deals with just the last hours. Yes. Um, interesting that the spirit of prophecy also says you should spend a thoughtful hour every day on the last hours of Jesus. Yes. So it's good that we must do that, right? And then there are special instructions given to his chosen followers and the remaining chapters deal with the crucifixion, resurrection, and the events before the ascension of Jesus. So there's a substantial portion that was given to the disciples on the last day, in the last portion of a day. So after Judas had departed, not one of those that were left was to be lost. It's interesting. Judas departed, yes, and the others are all in the book of life. They were the ones who were to receive the early rain. And so, I believe it will be in the end. The latter rain will fall on those who have been purged of the Judas syndrome. So when Judas left, that what remained received the early rain. At the end of time, when Judas leaves the company of the believers, mm -hmm. those that remain will receive the latter rain. So you'll have a mini, or this was a mini shaking. This was a shaking. And also God removes the tears. Yes, he said to Judas, do what you do quickly. You see, Judas had made a decision in his heart. God knew about the decision, and he didn't prevent him. That's it. Because he knew he wasn't going to turn him around, so he said, whatever you're going to do, just do it quickly. Mm. And, and the disciples didn't know what he was talking about. They, they yeah. thought he had to go and get something or whatever. Now, after this purging, they received a message for their ears only. So there was no Judas left yeah. in the company. It was not preached to the multitude, but was for their encouragement. It was to equip them for their task of preaching the message with power. It was information that set them apart and fortified them against the errors of the scribes and the Pharisees. In other words, they had to be so settled in the truth that they could not be moved. That's, it. That's called sealing, Martin. Mm -hmm. Sealing time. Sealing time. In the same way, we need to be inoculated against these errors. Every wind of doctrine will be blowing. And in the midst of this, you need to cling to very sound instruction. 
Leute. I believe we are living in this time. We are sitting right now at the Last Supper. Very soon there will be a shaking. Judas will get up from the table and will leave. There are people that say, no, the disciples must leave and Judas must stay. Yeah, yeah. It's not that way around. It's the other way around. Laodicea doesn't have a coming out. No. It has a spewing out. That's it. What you do, go and do it quickly. Judas must leave. Judas must leave. Will Judas be an accusing brethren? Oh, definitely. Mm. And he, he might will... regret it later, but it'll, he'll be an accusing brethren. And he will bring the leaders for persecution towards you. This is all interesting typology. We need to understand it. We need to spend a contemplative hour. John 17, verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Those that received the former reign, those 11 disciples, none of them were lost. It says so. That's it. Except the son of perdition, the Judas principle, he'd left. So let's look at a statement in the spirit of prophecy as to what we can expect when we study John. This one quotes the book of John. So we need to study the word in the knowledge that God is speaking to us directly. Yeah. It's important that when you read, you must have faith that you are reading the word of God. That's very important. Like we, I think we've stated that quite clearly in past episodes. Yes. How important the true Word of God. You can't emphasize it enough. You must have confidence that what you are reading is the Word of God. And you must have confidence that God preserved His Word. Mm. So let's read this quote. Those only who read the Scriptures as the voice of God speaking to them are true learners. They tremble at the voice of God. For them it is a living reality. They open their understanding to divine instruction and pray for grace that they may obtain a preparation for service. The latter rain, is that a preparation for service? Definitely. That's the preparation for the most important work that can be done on this earth. As the heavenly torch is placed in his hand, the seeker for truth sees his own frailty, his infirmity, the hopelessness of looking to himself for righteousness. That's beautifully put. That embraces all the writings of Paul. Yeah. He sees that there is in him nothing that can recommend him to God. Let's just go back to those early disciples. At that last supper... They had three and a half years instruction in the University of Christ. Yes. And they were perfect, right? <laughs> no. They were pathetic. Yes. So maybe we're pathetic too, right? Exactly. They were arguing on the way to the Last Supper as to who was the greatest. Yes, they were argue arguing about who will sit on his left and right side. Correct. So they were full of themselves. And they hadn't realized their hopelessness and their nothingness yet, and that they had nothing to recommend themselves. And he prays for the Holy Spirit, the representative of Christ, to be his constant guide, to lead him into all truth. He repeats the promise, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, quoting John 14, verse 26. So this is how we, we must approach this book. This is a final instruction by the God of the universe for those who will be his representatives. So how important can it be? It's unbelievable. 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 Here's another quote from the Review and Herald. The will of God in regard to his people is plainly expressed in the 6th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 
16th, 17th chapters of John. Now that's the portion where Jesus speaks to his disciples intensely, yeah. instructing them as to what is important in terms of their mission. And then come the chapters that deal with the crucifixion itself. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand the 6th, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, the 17th chapter of John. The divine antidote for the sin of the whole world is contained in the Gospel of John. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, Christ declared, has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. So if we do not internalize the character of Christ, which is embodied in obedience to all of God's requirements, then we have missed the boat. And it also refers to the last day. So these words that Jesus gave to the disciples there is typologically for us going towards the last day. That's why we need to study it. He may die as Christ died, but the life of the Savior is in him. His life is hid with Christ in God. I am come that they may have life, Jesus said, and that they may have it more abundantly. He carries on the great process by which believers are made one with him in this present life to be one with him throughout all eternity. So, you know, some people may die. But if you have Christ in you, then you are not dead. You have eternal life. Yeah. I was thinking the other day, when God said, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. That was actually uh, a proclamation of mercy. Because the devil hates those that have accepted Christ as their personal savior and he hounds them and he follows them and he tries to destroy them and he makes their life a misery. So this, this walk, this earthly walk, has its pitfalls, right? And then you get older and you get tired and eventually you get so old and tired that you wish you could go to sleep. So then death becomes a mercy, right? And once you are asleep, nobody can get hold of you anymore. No. Nobody can hound you. Nobody can persecute you. They can throw tantrums. They can go and dig up the bones of Wycliffe, <laughs> grind them, burn them, grind them to a pulp, throw them into a river in a fit of rage. doesn't help them no. because Wycliffe doesn't know anything about it. He's totally at peace, resting in Christ, while all around them are throwing tantrums. Right? Not even the tax man can get hold of you anymore. <laughs> Nobody can get hold of you. It's actually a merciful situation. Yes. And when that day of resurrection comes, what a day it will be. There are those today who will present falsehoods as testing truths, even as the Jews presented the maxims of men as the bread of heaven. Sayings of no value are given to the people of God as their portion of meat, while souls are starving for the bread of life. Fables have been devised, and men are trying to weave these fables into the web. Those who do this will one day see their work as it is viewed by the heavenly intelligences. They choose to bring to the foundation wood, hay, and stubble when they have at their command the word of God with all its richness and power from which they can gather precious treasures of truth. How important is that statement for the times we are living in? Absolutely important. How, how many, many falsehoods do we have? How many winds of doctrine are no. blowing? even within the church. And if you don't cling to the word of God, no, you'll, you'll get up and walk. That's it. But it is Judas that got up and walked. Yeah. Hmm? Here's another statement from the Review and Herald. The food that is being prepared for the flock of God will cause spiritual consumption, decline, and death. 
When those who profess to believe present truth come to their senses, when they accept the word of God just as it reads, when they do not try to wrest the scriptures, they will bring from the treasure house of the heart things new and old to strengthen themselves and those for whom they labor. We have to be word-based Christians. There are those who say, not only in their hearts, but in all their works, my Lord delays his coming. That's another big problem, right? Remember, it's the wicked servant that says, my Lord delays his coming. Because Christ's coming has been long foretold, they conclude that there is some mistake in regard to it. But the Lord says the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry past the time that the message is borne to all nations, tongues, and people. Shall we who claim to be students of prophecy forget that God's forbearance to the wicked is part of the vast and merciful plan by which he is seeking to compass the salvation of souls? Shall we be found amongst the number who, having ceased to cooperate with God, are found saying, My Lord delays his coming? Martin, I hope we don't fall into that trap, but that we continue to say, He's coming, and he's, he's coming at the soon. door. He's at the door. And, you know, that's why we need to have a balance. We need to have a balance between what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. So we're at the door. That's it. But also, what is the spiritual fortification that we need for when he is at the door? Absolutely. I think it's time we started diving into the book of John, right? Yes, the Gospel those, of John. those chapters that we are admonished to yes. study. Let's just briefly go through some of the others as well. Hmm. So when we read the Gospel of John, then immediately we see what the burden of John is. Hmm. And it starts, as we have said a number of times already, with, in the beginning... What other book starts with that again, Martin? Genesis. Genesis. <laughs> I love these little, little connections that we find. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it talks about the witness, and that that witness was John the Baptist. Mm. And he testified. And in verse 11 which, by the way, is the beginning of a new paragraph. It says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So let's not be presumptuous. We are saved because God calls us, because we've all gone astray, and it is God that calls us back. So all honor and glory go to him. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now this is John writing. He's one of the sons of thunder. Mm. What changed him? Only Jesus could. Okay. He beheld his glory. Yeah. He, uh, that, that's the divinity of Jesus. He saw that he was God. He saw that he was God. But what, what did he see? Did he see a glorious mm. being shining with light? Yes, he saw it once at the transfiguration. He saw this glorious shining being. But what did he perceive before he saw the glorious shining being and before his character was changed? What did he perceive? He saw a man that came from poverty. He saw an unpretentious person. He saw a kind person. He saw a gentle person. Mm -hmm. He saw a person that had tremendous patience. He saw a suffering person. He saw the way in which he dealt with his suffering. 
And he marveled. And he thought to himself after a while, I wish I could be like that. I'm a son of thunder, mm. and I wish I could be like that. So what he, what he saw was the character of Christ. That's mm. it. And he saw also the meekness. Because if you're a son of thunder, meekness is not, your, uh, not a very big virtue. You always flame up and you've got a short fuse. I, I can relate to that. Where, the did way you I have a, did you have a short fuse, Martin? <laughs> yeah, just yeah. as short as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, did the Lord give you a wife to sort out your short fuse? Yes, he gave me a lightning conductor. Your poor wife. <laughs> And then it says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Mm. So who was older, John or Jesus? John. He was older by six months. Yes, he was older, but he says Jesus was before him. So he must have recognized something, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So basically what he's saying is the law, the books of Moses, mm. the Pentateuch, foreshadowed Jesus yeah. and what he would do for us, but the reality, the substance was manifested in Christ. Yeah. Beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, chapter 1 deals with who Christ is, that he is God. And then if we drop down to verse 35, it says, Again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples and looked upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he findeth his own brother Simon. And so it continued. This one found that one and that one found that mm -hmm. one. And the two of them eventually found this one and someone found Nathaniel. And so one after the other they came through the witness of what some saw, through what John saw, they came to Christ, right? And all Jesus says, come and see. So he's not telling them anything. No, come and, come and see for yourself. Come see for yourself. See what it's all about. So that's the burden of chapter 1. We want to get to the instructions mm. that are important for our time. So we're not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the book of John. Then in chapter 2, you have the cleansing, the turning of the water into wine. Now, we've talked about that already, so that's a very important uh, message, that the real cleansing comes through the blood of the Lamb. Chapter 3 deals with Nicodemus, and that you have to be born again. You have to get a spiritual insight. And this discussion is, is, is fascinating. It deals with so many aspects. It deals with uh, who Jesus is. So if we just look at verse 7, it says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. There needs to be a spiritual birth. If you drop down to verse 14, he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Mm. That was an important clue. And, and 
Nicodemus internalized that. And when the crucifixion took place, he understood that Christ had become sin for us. The disciples ran away, mm. but Nicodemus remembered this statement of Jesus. And there are very important lessons that follow. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Those are probably the most famous verses in the whole of the Gospel of John. Maybe the Bible even. Well, it's the summary of the entire character of God in the Bible. It is the difference between true religion and false religion. Any religion that doesn't embrace that has a wrong concept of the character of God, which is sad. That's it. Now, after we've read what Jesus told Nicodemus, and this is so important, because in verse 18, he says to Nicodemus, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's dealing with the character. The name deals with the character. You have no concept of what God is all about if you don't understand Jesus. This is the burden of John. The son of thunder who looks at Jesus and realizes that his character falls for far short. Mm, but it's important, like you just said, to realize he's talking about the character, not the pronunciation of his name. Now, Jesus is saying these things. Mm, because exactly. if, you, if you read it here in the Gospel of John, the, the words are in red. Mm -hmm. Jesus speaking. Let's get another witness. Now we turn to John. Drop down to verse 22 and verse 23. They are bold in my, in my Bible. In other words, this is a new paragraph. So verse 22, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Enon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. And then interesting in verse 25, which is again a new paragraph, there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. That's interesting. Because Jesus has just explained to Nicodemus how one is purified. Mm. You have to be born again. Yes. And the purification is not something that you do through your ritualistic uh, endeavors, but through the blood of Christ. So this dispute arises, and they consult John. Now, John doesn't go into details and tells them what they must do and how many times they must wash and all of these things. But he gives a witness under the full power of the Holy Spirit. And he says in verse 30, referring to Christ, He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies, and no man receiveth his testimony. Interesting. So here John is saying that Jesus is from heaven, mm. and that he is above all things, and has full knowledge about the Godhead, because he himself is God. And then he says, no man receives his testimony. Mm. So if the Spirit doesn't convince you, no. You won't get there. Exactly. You have to be born again. I just want to mention that we mustn't get confused here. This John that is speaking here is John the Baptist. Yes. 
It's not John that wrote the gospel. Correct. It's not John that wrote the gospel that he's speaking here. He's quoting John the Baptist. Yeah. Remember that they were disciples of John the Baptist. And here John is saying an interesting thing. If we read from verse 34, it says, For he, for he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son and has given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. That is a powerful testimony by John the Baptist. Because he brings out how important it is to have faith without seeing. Now immediately after this conversation, in chapter 3, where you have the witness of Jesus to Nicodemus, and you have the confirmation of that witness by John the Baptist. In chapter 4, you have the woman at the well in Samaria. So you're moving from God's people and their representatives, Nicodemus, mm. and those that were listening to the message of John the Baptist, you move to the despised Samaritans. The story is in the Gospel of John to show that Jesus is no respecter of persons. Unlike what the Jews would have done, the next story deals with this woman. And a woman is typologically a symbol of the church. So God's church includes all of humanity, even the despised Samaritans. And this woman, when she recognized Jesus as the Messiah, she ran to her city and said, come and see a man who told me all things about myself. One who knows everything. This is the Messiah. She had not one iota of doubt. Mm. And it just shows how all-embracing God's love is. Yes. I think you hit the nail on the head. And this is the first time that Jesus actually says plainly that he is the Messiah. Mm. This is unbelievable. He didn't say it to Nicodemus. He didn't say it to anyone he else. He said it to a Samaritan woman. He actually didn't say it to the ones that were supposed to know it. Yes. And it says here in verse 25 and 26, the woman says unto him, I know that Messiah cometh which is called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things Jesus said unto him, I that speak unto thee am he. Unbelievable. To a Samaritan woman, he says, I am the Messiah. Messiah. What does that tell us about evangelism? That you don't have to hold back. You have to go to the world that does not know about the Messiah that does not have this word and tell them Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. That's what you have to tell them. So, Martin, there's a work to be done because the greatest portion of humanity denies that Christ is the Messiah. Let's drop down to chapter 5. In chapter 5, we have this interesting story that takes place at the pool of Bethesda where this lame, impotent man had been laying for 38 years. That's a very interesting time period mm. because those 38 years represent the wandering of the children of Israel in the desert when they had to return after having come to Canaan. They could have entered in, but they did not enter in. They wandered for 40 years, remember, but two had passed already, mm. and they were turned back for another 38 years because they did not believe. Because they had their superstitious ways and did not trust God's word completely. Mm. So here was this impotent man who had been lying there all this time. So he was a symbol of the unbelieving 
wandering Jews, destitute in the wilderness experience that they were in. And he's lying at this pool, and they believed that the water would be stirred when an angel came down. And this was a superstition that they had. And Jesus addresses him and says, Wilt thou be made whole? And the man says, I have no one. That's a rather sad statement, right? I have no one. No one. No one. All the other holy ones, as they perceived themselves, were around there. But yes. Nobody helped him. Nobody helped him. He had no one. And God set the record straight. And it was on the Sabbath day. And this enraged the Jews. It set up the controversy and the conflict between true worship and false worship. Is there a lesson in it for us today? Oh, definitely. Are there rituals in the world where people believe that certain uh, things will happen if you do certain particular things? If you go through rituals. If you go through rituals or you go to a particular faith healer and... Uh, you trust that when you are able to go to a particular place like Lourdes or wherever, there your probability of being healed is so much greater than if you stayed at home. Mm. How ridiculous. Is God not everywhere? Mm. Do you have to undergo a pilgrimage to a specific spot in order to find his grace? No, it's a false religion. So what Jesus does... In chapter 5 is he addresses false religion. So this healing that we had at the pool of Bethesda was a very, very important pivotal point mm. because it created the opportunity not only for enlightenment but out of the conflict that arose between Jesus and the Pharisees the truth was presented to them, and they could either accept it or reject it. Yeah. For after all, a great miracle had taken place, right? They had a witness. You had so many things happening at the same time, uh, uh, simultaneously, like you mentioned. It was He was standing between this man and the pool, and yes. not even looking at the pool. Not even looking at the pool. He was ignoring the pool because the pool was a superstitious belief system that they had embraced, which denied the power of God yes. and relied on human strength to go and crawl into that pool. So they showed, I am the, the healer. Look at me. Yes. And then secondly, what also he did is he did it on the Sabbath Yes. to show them He's the healer and Lord of the Sabbath. Correct. That's why it says in verse 17, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. And then he enraged them because he said, But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. They fully understood what he said. Yes. That he was God. And can you now say that he broke the law? He broke the Sabbath law. How can he break the law if he's Lord of the Sabbath? So he didn't break it. He broke it according to them. Yes, according to their human dictates. Will there be a similar case Exactly. That's Coming what soon. I want to. Bring. Will there be a human law which will be contrary to God's law, worthy of pronouncing the death sentence of, on someone who doesn't keep the human law? Yeah. We're heading for the same situation, Martin. And then Jesus answered, and he said the following, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. They have the same power. They have the same authority. Yeah. They have the same mindset. 
And then he continues, For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Now he's talking about the works. They just witnessed a tremendous miracle. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which has sent him. You can only come to the Father through Christ. And in Christ is the only means whereby you can understand the Father. If you see the Son, you have seen the Father. He continues and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Here's a theological sermon on salvation. That's it. And who is he giving it to? To the leaders. To the leaders. Yes. So this confrontation was brought about to bring a theological reality and a discourse to the Jews, to the leaders. How would they react? Mm, furious. Furious. And then he... Then he confirms that he is the resurrection and the life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son to have life within himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a title that you find in the book of Daniel. I saw one like the Son of Man come to the Ancient of Days. This is a judgment scene that takes place in heaven. Mm. So these two titles, Son of God, Son of Man, are unique to Christ. That's it. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So he's giving them a theological lesson, and he's infuriating the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> he's got everybody covered there. All right. So do we have similar religions today? Mm -hmm. They might believe, they might not believe in a resurrection, but they believe in a reincarnation. Here is theology at its best. It tells us what the position of the Son is. It tells us all judgment is given unto him. It tells us that the power of the resurrection is in his word, that he will raise them up on the last day, that there are two resurrections. In this place, it doesn't tell us that they're separated by a thousand years, but later in the book of uh, Revelation, we get to understand that also. Now, if we read verse 31, Martin, it says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Mm. Because you need more than one witness, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is very important. There's another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth, but I received not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was burning, he was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. So he just performed a mighty miracle. He's bearing witness of himself to them. And he's saying, all right, you don't want to accept my testimony that I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the one that has the power of resurrection at my disposal because I and the Father are one. We are God. They just recognized that he'd said that. Now he brings in the witness of John. And uh, he says, John testified of these things. And we read it just now. 
this in the previous verse. Where John testified of these things. And then he says in verse 36, but I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, and the Father has sent me. So there's another witness. And the Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye, and ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he has sent, him ye believe not. So Martin, he's saying that there are a number of witnesses that testify to the fact that he is who he claims to be. Mm. One, he talks about himself. He says, all right, you say that witness is not true because I'm testifying of myself. But what about John? Yes. You were happy to abide in his light. He testified of exactly the same thing. But you won't believe him now. Yes. Because you don't want to believe me. Behold, the yes. Lamb of God. Then he says, what about the works? Mm. The works testify that I am who I claim to be. Have you ever seen a man, lame, get up and walk just by my word on the Sabbath day that you are contesting and saying I'm a lawbreaker because of that? Whereas I am showing you I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am your creator and you keep the Sabbath because I said that I created the earth, the heavens and everything in them in six days. Mm. But you won't acknowledge me as the creator God if I give life to someone who is dead for 38 years, in a sense. And then the father, he says, testified. Where did the father testify? At the baptism. At the baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the people heard him. So there was a witness from heaven. There was a witness on earth. John the Baptist, the works testify. And then he says, in verse 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So there are four witnesses. Yeah. John testified, the works testified, the Father testified, and the scriptures testified. There's no doubt about this issue. So now, Martin, that we have laid the groundwork for the message that is to come to God's people to prepare them for the latter rain, mm -hmm. which is ensconced in the message to the disciples who were to receive the former rain. I think we should uh, take a break and do this in another episode. We'll continue later. Thank you. Let's do that. Will you pray for us? Yes. Heavenly Father, the riches and the beauty of the Gospel of John that has these four great witnesses that testify to the truth and doesn't even include the witness of the disciples at this stage, sets the stage for what is coming. May we internalize these words, make them our own, believe them with all our heart and with all our mind because the testimony is true based on the witnesses. And may we be ready when the time comes, when that final conflict takes place. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.